In this video, we're gonna talk about the simple seven step sales process that made me $30 million. Now, just for some context, we went from about zero to two and a half million a month in two years, which two and a half million a month is a $30 million a year piece. What you're gonna learn in this video is the sales process, the seven step sales process. We teach all of our clients, we've trained probably over 10,000 salespeople, we've trained hundreds of sales teams. It's also what allowed me to make over $400,000 a year as a commission-based sales rep, just selling one-on-one -on -one and doing one call, two call closes. So we're gonna splice over to some slides now. Enjoy the video. Alrighty guys, let's dive into the belief blueprint. So using the seven beliefs the prospect needs to have to buy and incorporating those into your sales process. So first, a little quick context on me. I am the owner of Closers.io, but I wasn't always that way. In 2016 and 2017, I was a full-time sales rep, and I was probably the worst sales rep in existence. Um, and in fact, the first team I was actually on, there was uh, six just killer reps, and I was pretty much the worst. And one of the things that I did is in an effort to try to find out why I was not that very good, I would listen to a lot of these really good closers calls. And when I would listen to the calls at the end of the calls, what I would find is that instead of them like handling a bunch of objections or doing a bunch of objection jujitsu and using all of these fancy rebuttals, it was actually quite the opposite. So I expected them to be doing all those things. They actually weren't getting any objections. And what I first thought is like, man, is this like the lead quality? Am I not just not getting the right leads? But what I realized is what they were focusing on is not objection handling, but objection prevention. So for me personally, after realizing that, after that plus 3,000 plus calls, I basically created a framework that allowed me to have an immense amount of success. And essentially this framework is boiled down as follows, okay? There's seven beliefs the prospect needs to have to buy, and you can look at it to the inverse as well. So there's also seven limiting beliefs that the prospect needs to have to buy as well, right? So there's seven limiting beliefs and also seven empowering beliefs. So our whole sales process, all it is, is using the right skill questions to break down the seven limiting beliefs and reinstall the empowering beliefs in our prospect before we transition to the close. And in doing so, we can create what's called an objectionless close. To where instead of having to hard close the prospect, the prospect closes themselves. And they do that because they look at us as a leader and not a salesperson. So all great salespeople and great sales scripts are doing this and incorporating this into the process, whether they really know it or not, and these seven beliefs is exactly what this presentation is about. So what we're gonna cover is the seven beliefs, how to build them, and then also the entire sales process as a whole. So let's get into the beliefs. So let's get into the beliefs. Um, the first one is pain, okay? So there has to be a problem or an unfulfilled desire, right? So business is about solving problems, and that's because when you solve a problem, you create value and money falls value. If we know that to be true, then sales is really just a demonstration we can solve a problem for somebody else. And if there's no problem, there's no sale. So we always have to start with the problem or the gap. And there's two types of problems. There's essentially a pain, which like think of back pain, that's a problem, okay? That's like I have a headache, I go buy an aspirin to fix the headache, that's a problem, that's a pain. But there's also a different type of problem called an unfulfilled desire. So imagine you're somebody who, you're really healthy, your blood works great, you have a great, uh, like a decent physique, you're just like an average healthy person, but you wanna get down to 6% body fat so you can compete on stage, right? There's nothing wrong with you, there's no pain, but you're fixing an unfulfilled desire. The next belief is doubt. So that's the inability to fix that unfulfilled desire or pain on your own, or it might not be that there's an inability to do it, but they see the value in getting there faster through somebody who's already done it, right? It's, it's much more or less costly in the, in the form of energy, attention, time, resources, et cetera, to just do it from somebody who's, or to learn from somebody who's actually done it. The next pain or the next belief is cost, okay? So cost means the cost of an action is greater than the cost of investing into your product or service. And that's not just the cost of money, but the cost of time, energy, attention, reputation, and money going into doing whatever you're selling, right? So the cost of an action stretched out over a long enough time frame has to be greater than the cost of investing in said product or service and all those forms of investment. It's a very big one. The next one is desire. So desire is the compelling payoff of fixing the problem, okay? The next one is money. Money is the resources and willingness to fix the problem, okay? So while desire is pretty straightforward, desire is like, it's, it's the heaven island if pain is the hell island, right? Money is the two things, the resources and the willingness to fix the problem, 
Okay, so the resources means like, do they physically have the resources? If you're selling a program for 5K teaching weight loss, well, you might have somebody on the phone who literally has $1,000 in their bank account and a 500 credit score. Sure, they could get resourceful, but they really don't have the resources, okay? Willingness is very different. So willingness means they maybe have the resources, they just weren't willing, okay? They didn't believe that the cost was worth it. So for instance, I had a dating coach who I coached way back in the day, and he was selling a lawyer, and the lawyer was making a quarter million dollars a year, but spending 5K with the coach to fix his dating life, he had the resources, he just wasn't willing. Why wasn't he willing? It goes back to cost. So it goes right back up to the cost belief, which is one of the most important beliefs. Support is people around you, close to you, support you in fixing the problem, okay? So this is your spouse objection. This is your partner objection. This is your, uh, you know, if they have a board, if they have a CFO, then you need to get on board. It could be also maybe the, the decision maker is not the one fulfilling on the project and managing the project, and he needs to get buy-in from his team. So support is all the stakeholders and decision makers involved, support them in fixing the problem. And then the final thing is trust, okay? And there's three types of trust. There's obviously trust in the salesperson, trust in the company, but the one nobody talks about that is specific to how I teach it is there's trust in the methodology. And so we'll talk more about this later, but they must believe that your solution is the simultaneous explanation of why everything they tried in the past has failed and why this is going to be different, okay? So I'll repeat that, that's super key. And this is great for sales copy and it's great for actually selling over the phone. Your solution has to be positioned to where it's a simultaneous explanation of why everything they tried in the past has failed and why this is going to be different. So for instance, if I'm selling you a plan or a coaching to do the ketogenic diet, this is one I always use, by the nature of me explaining to you what the ketogenic diet is, I first start to explain insulin resistance and why that's the reason people are fat. And so that's why we get into a state of ketosis so that ultimately we can be in a fat burning state and eventually lose our weight and be healthy and, and la da 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 da. So by the nature of me explaining really what the ketogenic diet is and why it's important and what happens if you don't have it, I also give you insight into why you failed in the past with everything and why this is going to be different, right? The ketogenic diet's a very easy one, but for instance, when we sell sales recruiting, what we do is we explain basically the status quo of what most people in the sales recruiting industry are doing, why that's an issue, and how we're different in our specific methodology. So by the nature of somebody understanding basically our pitch, our offer, they also understand if they tried sales recruiters before or if they've done it themselves, why they failed in the past. So not only does it pitch a product or service, but it gives insight, okay? And this removes the objection of like, I've seen this before, I've done this before, um, well, how is this different from the competitor? Oh, I tried something like this. They'll never say that if they believe that your solution is unique, different, superior, faster, whatever, than whatever they tried in the past. And if also they understand why they failed in the past by the nature of understanding your methodology. So that's huge, okay? We'll talk more about that later. So moving on next is remember that all of these issues are predicated on the problem, okay? I said this before, but business is about solving problems. That's because when you solve a problem, you create value and money follows value. So if we know that to be true, sales is really the demonstration we can solve a problem for somebody else. But if there's no problem, there's no sale, okay? So what we do is essentially the very beginning of the sales process. We start with the problem, we find what that gap is, whether it's a problem or unfulfilled desire, then we put our shovel in the ground and we start digging. And that's when we establish the rest of the six beliefs because as you've noticed, they've all, they're all predicated on pain which is the most important one. So how do we install it? Here's what the call flow looks like. We start with introduction. Introduction has two parts, that's rapport and frame. So we'll get into that, it's very, very simple. That part of the call is really nothing uh, revolutionary, to be candid. Then we have the information gathering phase, okay? In the information gathering phase, there's two syntaxes that I use, okay? Now, so essentially for these seven beliefs, you can execute these in any order that you want. What matters is that you execute them before you transition to the close, okay? But the syntaxes are the ways I found after doing thousands and thousands of calls, and actually what really solidified these is coaching hundreds of sales reps. What I found is there's two different methods that are kind of the best orders to ask the questions so that things build upon each other and they're given the right context, okay? Now, problems for syntax is for pain, right? Back pain, um, 
like people who are maybe obese and trying to lose weight, anything that's like a real problem to where it's very away from, we use a problems first syntax. Goals first syntax is for unfulfilled desires. Maybe it's somebody who's making 100K a year in a corporate job and they really wanna leave their nine to five, so essentially they can start a new company. Um, there is a little bit of pain there, right? There is a problem if they're really unsatisfied with their nine to five job, but more, more than not, that's more of an unfulfilled desire, right? Competing in the bodybuilding competition is a perfect example of an unfulfilled desire. So with unfulfilled desires, we start with goals first syntax. And really, to be honest, you could do either or for almost any situation, but I do have, I have found tremendously, it helps when you do problems first for pain and goals first for unfulfilled desire. Then what happens is we do a transition. The transition is a very important phase of the call because what happens with a lot of salespeople is they have great discoveries where they're actually asking the questions, but then what happens is before transitioning to the pitch, it's very clunky and it builds a ton of sales resistance. So we wanna transition in a way that's very, very like just nonchalant, no sales resistance, and the way I do it, which you're gonna learn in a little bit, I actually get them to ask me to pitch them. It's pretty cool. The next part is pitch. Right? So the pitch is the part where we explain our methodology. We're not really spending a lot of time explaining the nuts and bolts of the program or the nuts and bolts of what we're offering. We're explaining our methodology, which again, needs to be the simultaneous explanation of why everything they tried in the past has failed and why this is gonna be different. The committing phase is getting their buy-in that this is the right thing and now is the right time. Right? Price aside. So the committing phase, as I'll, as I'll say it again, is essentially getting their buy-in that the method is what they believe is the best route to their success. So for instance, the method is what's in the pitch, that's the methodology. If you know Russell Brunson, when he pitches you on ClickFunnels, he doesn't pitch you on the fact that click funnel, you should buy ClickFunnels, ClickFunnels is the best. What he pitches you on is that funnels is the fastest, most effective, best way to get customers online. But if you believe that to be true, then buy the, a byproduct of that belief is buying click funnels. So by the nature of you believing into the methodology, you buy the product as a byproduct. Does that make sense? So our committing phase is getting them bought in of if they believe the method is what they need to do to get to that result. So if I was selling click funnels, the committing phase is not getting them tied down on click funnels. The committing phase is getting them tied down if they're 100% certain that funnels, not click funnels, but funnels as the method is the way to get the best way, most effective, uh, effective, fastest, whatever, to get customers online. Does that make sense, right? If this was a ketogenic diet, the committing phase is essentially their buy-in that keto, getting in a state of ketosis, is going to be the solution to get to their goals. It's do they believe that to be true? Then at the end of the committing phase is when we actually get them to ask us what the price is again so we can transition to the close without sales resistance. This is how we get the prospect closing themselves, okay? The last phase is objection handling, and that's essentially where we handle any objections. We break down any resistance. We're not gonna cover that in this training because it'd be too long. So, problems first syntax versus goals first syntax. We pretty much already covered this, but uh, what we're gonna cover in this training is goals first syntax, because uh, problems first syntax is a little bit more complex and would take too long to cover. So, call flow. We're gonna start with rapport and frame the call. So here's how the call starts. I say, hey, is this John? Hey, John, it's just Cole here, uh, what's up? And you know, John says, oh, you know, nothing, whatever, whatever. And I usually share something that's going on in my world. So I'll say, awesome, man, I actually just got done with a workout and then I'm uh, super excited to chat with you. So you've been having a good week, good week so far? So I just say something like, how's the day been so far? How's the week been so far? Just something really low key. Okay, and then basically whatever they say, as soon as they volley back to me, it could be, oh yeah, week's great. Or they could go on and do, say two or three sentences. I'll transition to my next line here, which is great. Well, I, uh, I, I know we got a limited amount of time here. So are you ready to jump in? You got a clean sheet of paper so that I take notes with? So I'll say that line because essentially, if especially if this is an audio call, which is when I did it back in the day, it was like almost before Zoom was cool. So if it's an audio call, when I say, you ready to jump in, I always wanna get buy-in, then I also tack on, you got a clean sheet of paper or something to take notes with. Because what happens is, is you don't know if it's an audio call, if they're driving, you don't know if they're leaving the office, you don't know if they're at their kid's baseball game, you don't know where they're at. So this sits them down 
And first of all, qualify as if they're in a buying position, a buying uh, situation. The second thing it does is it sits them down and gets them fully focused and present on what you're saying, which is very, very, very key. Okay. Now I put it at the bottom here. Um, if they're skeptical, I throw in, um, is, is, is now still a good time to connect? Like, you know, sometimes you have somebody you're like, Hey, is this John? Yeah. Hey John, John, just Cole here from uh, closers.io. What's up? Oh, you know, uh, I just forgot I had this call. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. I'll just get on with it. Oh, okay. I mean, is, are, are you sure? Like, is, is, is now still a good time to connect? Oh no, it's, you know, so I get them, I kind of pull away to get them to come in a little bit. Right. I don't use that totally a, a ton of times, but just a little tactic there you can uh, pepper in. The next part is frame. So this part is super basic and uh, a lot of gurus will be like, don't frame the call. Uh, framing the call is salesy, but I'll tell you this. If you're a part of any business, uh, professional business meeting, the first thing they do in any professional business meeting, like we have a hundred employees. The first thing we do in every meeting is we state the agenda for the meeting. So if you're selling B2B, I don't really think it's unusual to state the agenda of the meeting on a sales call, especially if you do it in a cool way where it doesn't sound super canned and like weird. Okay. The other thing is too, is I find this gives inexperienced salespeople a little bit better sense of control, which helps them throughout the call. And I don't feel like it's a net negative whatsoever. Okay. Um, so with that being said, here's how you frame the call. So it's clean sheet of paper so that if they do it, so it's ready to dive in. He's like, Oh yep, I'm ready. And then I wait till they're, they're sitting down and they're like present with me. And I'll say, gotcha. Well, so, you know, John, what I've really found to work best on these calls is first just diving deeper into the specifics of your business and your sales process. So what's working right now, what's not working right now. And ultimately what you really feel like are the biggest challenges that are uh, keeping you from moving forward. And once we get some clarity there, if uh, we can help, I'm more than happy to walk you through what that is, you know, based on uh, what we find out. Uh, or if not, you know, I can refer you to somebody I know, or just give you some homework to work on in the meantime, based on whatever you need. Cool. And then, uh, they say, yeah, that sounds, that sounds totally cool. And then I'll say, gotcha. So that being said, probably our best place to start is what would you say is, I guess your biggest challenge in your business right now, or like what's not working at the level it truly could be or that it should. So a couple things, uh, the first part there, I mean, it's pretty much copy and paste. Uh, you know, there, there's different ways you can do this. Um, but this is a strong frame. Okay. So personally I find when teaching most salespeople, they need to do a little bit of a stronger frame. It gives them a little bit more control. Nowadays, what I might say is, yeah, John. So I'm more than prepared to sh share with you some of the lead generation strategies we've used with real estate agents in your area. But, um, everything we do is, is essentially all customized. So at this stage, um, what probably is going to make the most sense is let me get an idea of kind of your lead gen right now, your market, what type of customers that you want. And then based on that, I can share with you the parts of what we do that'd be the most relevant and useful to you specifically. So if it's a more sophisticated market and I want to be a little bit more flexible, I'll use something like that, but this is very, very good for most things. Now this is obviously geared toward geared toward a business. So if you're doing health or dating or insurance or whatever you're doing, you just want to change this a little bit to kind of adjust it for what you're doing. And then at the end here, when I say what's the biggest challenge in your sales right now, or what's not working at level it truly could be, uh, obviously it could be, you know, in this example, I'm selling business training or sales training, right? Um, if it's health, you just say health. If it's dating, you could say dating life. Um, you know, it, it essentially is just whatever you're, you're going right. It's like the shut across the bow to find that unfulfilled desire or to find the pain. And sometimes if this question doesn't really make sense for your company, I just say, you know, so based on the ad that you saw earlier from our company, what, um, and I guess what ultimately prompted you to reach out. Okay. Now also notice my tonality when I'm asking these questions. Okay. So I'm not saying, yeah. So that being said, probably what's the best place to start is, you know, tell me your biggest challenge and, and what's not working level truly could be that it should. I'm not saying that I'm saying, yeah. So, you know, probably our, uh, best place to start is what would you say is, I guess your biggest, um, challenge in the business or like what's not working at the level it truly could be or that it should. So you see how I'm like varying my tone and almost like there's a, there's a part of me that's trying to find the right words to say, like, I don't know what to say. That's all by design. Right. And then also with the biggest challenge, it's kind of one of those things that it's a very direct way to start the call. 
But when I say, or like what's not working at least at a level you truly feel like it could be that it should. It's a softener to give them permission to actually speak to their challenges. So a few little nuanced things there. Now, here's the syntax flow for goals for syntax. The first thing we're gonna do is isolate the challenge slash why are they here, which we kind of just did. And then we're gonna probe and ask any background questions if needed. So obviously we just did that. What's the biggest challenge right now? What's not working the level truly could be able to should? Or you might just say like what ultimately prompted you to reach out, okay? Uh, now, when they start talking, just try to get a full picture of what they're saying. I mean, this is not like rocket science, but like imagine you're trying to paint a portrait in your mind and you need their help to really fill out all the details in the portrait. So you're gonna say stuff like, tell me more. Hey, when you said blank, what do you actually mean exactly? How do you mean exactly? You're gonna say questions like that, right? Uh, you might repeat the last three words of what they say. Like, man, you know, the last three months, my business has just been extremely stressed. Extremely stressed? You know, you might say something like that, right? Um, then you're also gonna ask any background questions if needed. So background questions is usually in a business context. And the point of background questions is just to get any context that you need to be able to essentially uh, run the sales call. So like if it's a business, I need to know what problem are they solving? Whom are, who are they solving it for? So like what problem, for who, and how are they selling it? You know, what's the price? How does the acquisition system look? How do people go from a stranger to a paying client? Like we just need to know like context on like how the business actually works. And so this could be, this could apply if you have insurance, like you need to know some like basic easy details. We wanna throw these in in the beginning just because they're very non-invasive and we gotta get the information anyways. So it's like, it gets, it gets them in a pattern of asking us ask, or uh, them answering our questions without um, saying anything too invasive. So a uh, quick note on probing questions. We kind of covered these, but when you say blank, what do you mean exactly? Um, why do you say that though? Um, and, and why is that important now though? Uh, one of my favorites I learned from Jeremy Miner is, is, um, is you could say, has that put you in a tough position? Um, and they're like, yeah, in, in what way though? So you could say something along the lines of like, um, like I, I know in a health offer, one of the things I taught is I'm like, so you know, you know, based on how you're feeling with your health right now on a, on a scale of one to 10, like where do you feel like your energy is at compared to what it really could be? And um, they'll be like, well, you know, like a three. A three, oh yeah, and then they say whatever. Gotcha, I mean, ha, ha, you know, given that you have a really high performing position at work and you're only a three out of 10 on what your energy truly could be and that it should, um, does that put you in a tough position? Like, oh yeah, you know, whatever. In, in, in what way though? So that's a great question you can ask in terms of really getting in and like probing down the pain. Um, now, after we isolate the challenge and we probe a little bit, we ask background questions, we go into desired situation, right? So we're, you know, even though it is goals for syntax, we do kind of isolate the problem a little bit and start with why they're here, just to kind of get a good shot across the bow. I feel like it's the most effective way. Then we go in desired situation, which is where we cover the ultimate goal, the monetary goal, the long-term vision, and the non-monetary goal. So we'll cover this right now. So the ultimate goal, I'll say, gotcha. Well, like what might make more sense is kind of to begin with the end in mind here. So ultimately, what's the goal? And then we're gonna start asking probing questions again. Now that phrase, ultimately, pause, what's the goal? It gets them to really cut through a lot of the clutter and tell you at its core what's most important, okay? And this is one of those things where it's very, very good to follow up with things like, so why is that important though? Or any sort of probing questions like that, okay? Um, then what we want, and, and you might, like when you ask this ultimately what's the goal question, you may get a lot of these things that are follow-ups to what I'm about to ask here, but what we wanna look for is also a monetary goal. So like if they have this big grand vision, that's great, but what we wanna do is peg like a number to it. So I'll say, and what's your monetary goal? This is like in a business context, guys. Obviously in, in weight loss, you would say, and what's the actual weight you wanna be at? If it's dates or dating, you say, like well, how many dates do you wanna get a week, right? Or if it's investing, like what is the exact like ROI or passive income cash flow that you want monthly? So you just gotta peg like, a number on it because it helps us define what the gap is. So I say, what's your monetary goal? Let's say I'm selling a real estate agent who wants lead generation. Oh, I want to get the $20,000 a month uh, net commission income. Gotcha. And so they say that really quickly. I'll say, gotcha. Well, um, it seems like you, 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 you thought of that number before. So um, can I ask like why that number? 
why 20K a month? Um, if it's a biz op type of thing to where they're trying to leave what they're doing full time to start something else, um, I would ask the question of like, okay, well, and, and how much money would you have to make just to replace the amount of income that you're making full time? Is that ultimately the goal, just to transition out of that? And, and, is, and is replacing that income enough to allow you to leave? Or like, how much would you have to actually bring in to like step in the door, hand in your two weeks, and be done with your nine to five? So with this question, not only am I really painting the picture of their goals, but at the same time, what I'm doing is I'm essentially um, finding out how much money they're making. Because let's say you're trying to sell somebody on like a, a business opportunity, you're starting a new career or whatever. It might be invasive to be like, well, how much are you making full time right now? But if I ask how much money we have to make just to replace the amount of income that you're making full time, then what happens is that because my question is framed as a goal, it's less invasive. Does that make sense? So I'm more likely to get the actual answer because of that. Um, and then so let's say, here's an example of some, some stuff we did earlier. But let's say they just say 5K a month. Oh, I just need to make 5K a month. So I say, okay, so 5K a month is what you're making right now, correct? Okay, I mean, and, and can I ask you an honest question? 5K a month, I mean, uh, you know, you have a family and, and, and kids. Um, uh, you know, does that level of income put you in a tough position financially? Yeah, in, in, in what way though? So again, you see how I'm using that to, uh, to probe. Okay, it's a great tactic. Then I'll say, and, and, and this, this question here, the long-term vision question, sometimes you get this already, so you don't need to ask it, but just know you're looking for like the extended vision. So I'll say, overall, what's your long-term vision for X? Overall, where do you wanna see your, with your health in 10 years? And that's, I'm asking that if I haven't already gotten the information already, okay? Then I ask this final question. And essentially what we wanna do with any sort of uh, desire is we wanna find the desire, but we wanna, we wanna attach it to another area of their life. So if they're trying to lose weight, we want to attach that weight loss goal, not just to all the, the direct things associated with it, but something indirect. That could be showing up better in bed with their partner. That could be having a better relationship. That could be uh, making more money or having more energy with work, right? And you can do that for all of these things. Same thing with dating. So maybe they want to show up better in the relationship. But so it's not only that, but it's also their sex life. It's also you know, having this confidence will allow them to stick to their health plan better or show up at work at a more powerful level, right? Not just in the bedroom, but in the boardroom. Um, there's also obviously with the, with any sort of business income or, uh, make money type of thing, you know, if they're making more money, how is that going to affect another area of their life, right? It's not just going to affect them financially, but it might help their marriage. It might help them do something for their kids. It might help them do something with their health. So here's how we elicit that without, without saying something lame, like, well, how will this impact other areas of your life? Like, let's not do that, okay? So here's what you'd actually do. You'd say, now, um, can I ask you a personal question? And, uh, and the reason why I'm asking is because my goal is not just to help you build a business that's building you wealth, but also one that's empowering you to live whatever lifestyle you wanna live. So when you think about that, what is that for you? You know, what comes up? What are the non-monetary goals, the personal goals you want your business to allow you to achieve? So you see how that framing of the question is tremendously better than, well, how would this affect other areas of your life? It's like, come on, guys. Um, when, when you ask this, you're utilizing a framework called permission, reason why, question. So permission is, can I ask you a question, right? They say yes. Now, what I do is I say now, bring back to the present moment, now. Can I ask you a personal question? So permission increases compliance. And when I say personal, when I ask you a personal question presupposes I'm gonna get a personal answer. Also increases compliance through that presupposition. So essentially when I say that, what's happening is, because uh, it's not about the questions you ask, it's about the answers you get. So the art is asking the questions in a way where you get the most increased compliance as possible. So I, I really, you know, I, I ask permission, then I, then I give the reason why I'm asking the question and I frame the reason why I'm asking the question in their own best interest. So I say the reason why I'm asking, the, the reason why I'm asking is because I don't wanna help you just build a, you know, and then I insert the benefit of why I'm asking this question in their own benefit. So, I, so now I, frame that, I framed it up so them giving me a very personal response and being super honest with me is totally in their benefit. Also increases compliance. Okay, and then I ask the question. 
So the deal is with this is like, when you ask like, well, how would this impact other areas of your life? You know, you're like a salesperson. They're like, uh, like, I don't know, it'd be nice. Like, I, you know, it's like, they don't really want to tell you cause it's like, eh. But when you ask it this way, it's, it's framed in such a way where they're really going to tell you. Okay. And again, it's not about the question. It's, it's not about the questions we ask. It's about the answers we get. Right. Because again, we want the prospect to speak these seven beliefs which we're covering right now, this is kind of the syntax in which we knock them off, right? But we want them to speak these seven beliefs into existence because by the nature of doing that, they're creating the consistency bias. If you study Robert Cialdini, the consistency bias is the number one highest influence on human behavior is the, the, the want and need to be appear to be consistent. So when we get them to speak these into existence, what's going to happen is they want to appear consistent. That's how we get them closing themselves. So, Next, and as you see here, we covered pain, we just hit desire, and we also hit money with that financial qualifier, with goals for syntax, okay? Now, we're gonna do current situation. So there's kind of like a couple of sections here, as you can see, there's isolate the, why are they here, slash isolate the challenge, that's section one. Section two is desire situation. Section, th section three is current situation, okay? This is where we cover pain, doubt, trust, cost, and support. So we cover everything else here really quickly. So here's how this looks. Um, and again, like, you know, I, I can't make a catch all script that like covers every single offer. So this one was built for a company I consulted that was teaching people how to leave their nine to five and start an Amazon business. Okay. So here's what we said for that company is now, um, and, and, and what do you say you did full time? And they say, Oh, you know, I'm a carpenter or I'm, I'm whatever I'm doing, you know, bus driver. I don't know. And then we say, uh, and this is another one I got from uh, Jeremy Miner just to give him credit, but they say, uh, we, we give what's called the two truths. So we say, um, oh, I got a Siri, get me. We say the two truths. So, oh, I'm a bus driver. Uh, okay, do you like it? And there's only two responses to this question. They either like it or they don't like it. Now, a lot of times in an offer like this, they're gonna say they don't like it, right? And when they say they don't like it, you want to use some probing questions. Okay, what do you mean when you say that? What, okay, so we probed a little bit. One of the ones I like is, uh, okay, well, well, and what's the worst part about that? Like, take me back to the day where, you know, you were at work and you came to the realization that is enough is enough and drew the line in the sand and said something has to change. What happened? Okay, so you see how instead of asking, like, why do they want to change? I'm asking for a specific story. Because what happens is with humans, there's a moment of decision. There's a moment of decision where essentially we draw the line in the sand, we say enough is enough. Okay? So typically what I want them to do is go back to that moment of decision and tell me about it because by the nature of them telling about that me, me about that moment of decision, they're reliving that experience and the emotions associated with it, which are the emotions of change. Right? So for instance, there was a guy who I asked this question to and he was telling me about how a shooter came into his school and his wife was a teacher. And he knew it that day, enough was enough and something had to change. There was another person who wanted to lose weight or I asked this and, and she said that, you know, my daughter hopped on my lap three days ago and said, mommy, you feel squishy. That was when she knew it was enough. So it's a, it's a circumstance. It's a specific thing we want to find. Okay? And what we also want to ask is, so we probe a little bit, we ask a good question like that. And then we say, gotcha. And you know, um, how long ha have you been doing that job for? And, and also like, how long have you been thinking about starting, starting this business? So, oh, I, you know, I've been a, I've been a carpenter for, you know, 10 years now. Wow. 10 years. Can I ask you another personal question? Um, you know, 10 years, like after all of that time, what made you draw the line in the sand and say, you know, enough is enough. Like, like what, what, what made you say this has got to be a priority now though, especially after all that time. So you see, again, I use, this is a little bit of a different framework. And again, like I, I kind of gave you the worst part. Take me back to the day. Obviously, once you sort of get to the moment of decision, you can move on. Like you don't want to pepper them with like the same questions and you're going in circles. Okay. Once you get the answer you need to move on, you get the cost, you move on right now. We're getting cost. Okay. We're getting the reason why we're getting a lot of cost. Okay, this is what's gonna create consistency. So here's the deal. This, this framework's a little bit different. Instead of permission reason why question, it's permission context question, okay? Can I ask you a personal question? Again, we already covered that, that's permission. Now we do context. Context is a little bit different. So I, I point out something they do in their behavior that could be perceived as irregular, 
And I asked them to justify that to me. So this person in this example, I'm like 10 years. Um, you know, after, after all that time, like why all of a sudden now though, see how I'm, I'm, I'm taking their behavior. I'm taking it. I'm, I'm basically isolating it. And I'm saying like it, I'm not saying that's abnormal, but it's kind of like, wow, that's, that's, that's remarkable. Why? Like, so I'm getting them to justify their behavior to me, which again is playing off that consistency bias generated by robot Chinese. Now, it, let's say they say they like their job. You say, oh, what do you like about it? Oh, I like this. I like this. I like this. Okay, great. Like how long have you been a bus driver for? Oh, I've been, I've been doing it for 10 years. Uh, and how long have you been starting to do this or think about doing this? Oh, like just like 30 days ago. Wow. I mean, can I ask you another personal question or can I ask you a personal question? I mean, you've been uh, a bus driver for 10 years now and, and you just started thinking about doing this like 30 days ago. Um, if, if, if I can ask like, why all of a sudden now though? So you see again, what I did. So with this two truths question, what I do is I essentially basically create a context and then I take that context of their behavior and their past behavior. I contrast it with their current behavior. And then I ask them to justify the change in behavior to me. That creates consistency, which is going to get them to close themselves at the end of the sales call. Okay. So now we go into doubt. So once you establish that, we'll go, gotcha. And you know, you've been trying to do this for three or four years now, right? Like what's been the biggest thing keeping you from doing this yourself? Like what, what's in the way? Then we'll ask a solution question. So doubt is just the inability to fix on own, you know, for, for an offer like this one, it's not going to be a big issue with solution. We want to see what have they tried in the past to be able to fix this? If anything, like, have they ever tried any solutions that are kind of somewhat similar to mine? Because if they have, I need to know that in advance so I can position my solution. Like I told you earlier as a simultaneous explanation of why that solution didn't work and why this is going to be different. So I'll say, gotcha. You know, and, and, and so for this, this, this thing, particularly, let's say it's an Amazon business, you know, have you reached out to anybody to help you start an Amazon in business in the past? Are you, and you're, so you're not working with anybody now? Um, have, have you been out there considering other coaches to potentially work with? So there's, there's different questions. You don't have to ask those all, but essentially we want to see like, what have they done? And then if they have done it, obviously it's like, well, okay, well, so, you know, you've, you, you hired two coaches, obviously your, your Amazon business isn't off the ground. Like, why do you think that is? And they're going to be like, Whoa, you know? and so then what you want to do is you want to use a triplicate or a duplicate question, which is essentially like, gotcha. So, you know, look like I've had thousands of these calls and typically whenever I find somebody trying to start an Amazon business in which they're essentially, um, you know, they get, they get into somewhere where it over promises and under delivers. We found through all of our experience, it's typically one of two things, either one, you blank, or two, you blank. Which one of those do you think it is? And typically what you're going to have them do is you're going to have them self select an option that explains why to themselves, why they failed in the past. And it also tees up your solution. So you can say later when you're explaining your solution, Hey, you know, you remember when uh, earlier on the call, you told me you didn't get results in that program because of blank. So we find that's a big issue. So what we do instead is blank, which ultimately allows you to blank. Now, based on your previous experiences in your program, do you feel like that, that probably is going to better help you get what you want here? So then now they're talking themselves into why their way or why your way is better than what they tried in the past. Then we ask support questions. So are you married? Uh, and, and a lot of times people are trying to make a life transition. So like, let's say somebody's trying, trying to start an Amazon business. I'll say, you know, is your, so, you know, you obviously want to leave your job you've been doing for 10 years now is your wife supportive? Like what, what does she think about this transition? Does she know you're on this call? What would she say if she knew you were on this call? You know, and, and right here, we don't want to do a bunch of reframing. If there is issues, we want to wait till later. Okay. We're just getting information right now. So now we've, we've executed the seven beliefs. We have all the, uh, we'll go back to this part. We've got pretty much six of the beliefs. We got trust. We got to do trust in the solution as well. Okay. So with the transition, essentially we say something like this. Um, so look, I don't feel like I have any more questions, but is there anything else you feel like we haven't covered that you feel like I need to know? They say, Oh no, I, I feel like you completely get where I'm at. Okay, great. So John, uh, based on what you told me previously, we can definitely help. 
Um, so that said, you know, where do you want to go from here? I can pretty much walk you through the process of exactly how we would help you get your real estate business at $20,000 a month if you want, but uh, you tell me where you want to go. And so essentially what happens here is instead of doing a big recap, hey John, let me just recap back your situation to see if I understand you correctly. And then you just like regurgitate everything they just said and they're like, they're like, okay, like good job, buddy. Instead of doing that, what you want to do is you just want to ask this question and then the response is, yeah, I feel like you totally get where I'm at. Hey, is there anything else you feel like I should know? No, I feel like you totally get where I'm at. So again, it's not about the questions you ask, it's about the responses you get. So I'm getting them to tell me, yes, you understand me, you know where I'm at. And also they could say something crazy here, like I can't invest today, <laughs> you know, who knows? Like there's a lot of stuff like that. Then you say, well, John, based on what you told me previously, and you can, you can insert some criteria there. You could say, based on what you said about this, this, and this. And then you say, we could definitely help. Uh, do not say, well, John, uh, based on what you told me originally, I think, uh, I think there may be a possibility we actually could help you. I, I know, I know some people teach that, but it's like, I, I, I look like I, I get it. I get it's like, you want to use trust-based language. I just can tell you from practice of reviewing like hundreds of calls. When people do that, it sounds so pathetic. So you need to give some certainty. It's like, we can definitely help. And then I put the insert thoughts optional. You could kind of like your thoughts, as you see on the bottom of the screen, could be a case study. For instance, blank, just like you, X time frame ago, had blank issue, and we were able to get them from blank to blank to blank, you know? So it could be a case study. I like telling a personal story. So I'll be like, and in fact, you know, for me, five years ago, I was kind of like in the same spot, and what I found was, you know, so a personal story is really great because it builds a little bit of trust. And uh, it could also just be some basic valuable insight on the what, not the how, right? So you could start to insert some thoughts, kind of explaining like, here's some of the, the biggest opportunities I think you have. And here's some of the things, uh, here's some like some of the things I really think that have kept you stuck in the past. So we wanna give them a little bit of insight to build some tension and tee up our pitch the right way. And then we use what I call the hamburger transition. So what happens is I say, so we're, I, I pass over control and I let them tell me where they wanna go from here. So I say, so where do you think we should go from here? I mean, I can basically walk you through exactly how we'd help you get to outcome if you want, but you tell me where you wanna go. So I say, where do you wanna go from here? And the last sentence is, you tell me where you wanna go. But in between that, that's what I call the hamburger, in between that, I say, I, I make a suggestion. So it's question, suggestion, question, suggestion, question. And in between that, essentially what I do is I tell them what I want them to tell me. So I ask a question and then I make a suggestion. In this framework, they'll always take, they'll always bite on the suggestion. They'll say, yeah, just walk me through the A to Z. That would be perfect. Yeah, dude, the A to Z would be amazing. You know, you could say something like, I could just tell you the nuts and bolts and the price if you would like, but you tell me where you want to go. Dude, nuts and bolts would be perfect. You could literally say anything here, but when you do question, it's like, it's the illusion of control. So, so you ask, where do you want to go from here? Make a suggestion. Then you, then again, you, you, where do you, well, you tell me where you want to go. They're always going to tell, they're always going to like take what you gave them. Okay. Now this does not work if you say it like this. Okay. Oh, uh, where do you want to go from here? I can, I can walk you through the process. I mean, if you want, but like you tell me where you want to go. Like, oh my God, if you say that it doesn't work. Okay. Like, so I, I like coach people back in the day were like, yeah, man, I tried your hamburger sandwich thing. It doesn't work. And I'm like, well, let me listen to it. And I'm like, yeah, you sound like a pathetic teenager who has no idea what's going on. So, okay, yeah, like you gotta use either equal or downward inflecting tonality on this thing, okay? And it works great. So now we're getting into the pitch, right? Again, the pitch is what? The pitch is the simultaneous explanation why everything they tried in the past has failed and why this is gonna be different. So here's how the pitch works. We do a high level promise. We'll cover that in a second. That's basically where we get them associated on the tangible outcome. Then we do a bridge, okay? The bridge can be uh, like four pillars or four keys or four stages or four phases, or it could also be three. I would never do more than five. I think five is a little bit overkill, but three to four is usually a good thing. Pillars one and two are gonna be paradigm shifts and pillar three and four are gonna be future pacing and eliminating the fear of failure. Okay, so let me explain this. Again, your pitch is what? The simultaneous explanation of why everything you tried in the past has failed, why this is gonna be different. Okay, so the first pillars are that explanation. That's where they're like, oh, that's why I, was, I failed in the past. That's why I didn't lose weight. That's why I couldn't get any girls. That's why I wasn't making money. Paradigm shifts. 
the pillar three, the future pace is essentially, um, it's like after we kind of fix the initial issues, I'm like telling them what we're gonna work on in the future so they can like see themselves actually having already achieved the main thing and like already getting the result, but it seems like we're still working on it together. So it builds certainty in the first couple of pillars. Pillar four is eliminating the fear of failure, which is also future pacing. So a lot of people like, they sabotage because as you know, you know, it's like they want to achieve X, but if they achieved X, actually Y would happen and they're afraid of Y. Like maybe if they had X amount of success, they would get a lot of publicity and they're afraid of like haters, right? So maybe my pillar four is like reputation management so we can take over the first page of Google so we can totally manage your reputation if anything like that would even come up. That's not a great example, but I think you get what I'm saying. It's like, it's, it's usually eliminating the fear of failure that they have subconsciously stuck in their brains. Then the last part of the three phases, three phases of the pitch is the delivery. So that's 60 seconds and that's just the nuts and bolts. Okay. So that's like, this is what most people's pitches are, but this is where you tell them like, yeah, so like, here's how we work together. Here's how many times we're going to meet. Here's what you get, blah, 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 blah. It's like, but you do that after really emphasizing and spending the most of the time on the over benefit and then the methodology. Okay. You just have to tell them the delivery. So they're like, okay, I get it. Like I, this is how we're working together, but you want to make that really quick. Okay. So here's what a high level promise would look like. So I'd say, gotcha. Um, so, so remember, I'm like, I asked the look, so where do you want to go from here? I can pretty much walk you through the process A to Z if you would like, but you tell me where you want to go. They're like, oh yeah, A to Z would be great. I said, okay, great. So do you have a pen and pad? Gotcha. So, um, on your piece of paper, write out one through four. And then I shut up. And so like, especially if it's audio again, like I'm the old school audio guy here. I would hear him be like, cause like they would say they'd have the piece of paper. And what's funny is like when you, when you sit there and you say this and you pause, you hear him get up and actually get the piece of paper. And they're like, okay, like one, two, three, four. And then they're, then they're, then they're ready. Okay. So basically, um, they're like, okay, I'm ready. And then you say, okay, great. And obviously it's on, if it's on zoom, you can, you can see him. Say, okay, great. So let, let me preface this by saying everything is customized with what we do to fit like a glove for specifically you, the client, based on where you're at. For you specifically, it's going to be four things. Four things to help you go from blank to blank while blank. Okay. Four things to help you really take your business, real estate business from kind of solopreneur land right now, 5K a month, to where you're doing about 30 to 40K a month in gross commissions or uh, net commissions monthly. And best of all, you have a full team under you and you're actually the rainmaker generating the leads and while and operating a business, not having a job. I just made that one up, but like it's current to desired situation while removing benefit or while getting benefit. Okay. Easy. Okay. So here's how you pitch the pillars. So I'll say the high level promise and they're like, okay. I say, great. So the very, when you come in, the very first thing you're going to do is what I, is what I call your pillar one. So if it's like a real estate thing, I'll say the very thing, first thing we're going to do is build out your authority campaign. I, I don't know. It's, it's some sort of methodology and some sort of pillar. Okay. Like, uh, for us, what we say in our sales recruiting uh, and sales team building program is we say, uh, the very first thing we're going to do is build out your sales systems. So it doesn't have to sound like bells and whistles. It can be just pretty basic, but it has to sound proprietary when it's put all together. So here's the formula for what you say here. And you don't always use this like super canned. You just gotta take the principles of this and then pitch it and like script it out so it makes sense. So you say something along these lines. You say, so look, uh, when it comes to desired outcome, here's the problem. Most people out there are trying to do incorrect behavior. And because of that, they end up having problem, which ultimately means the consequences of that problem, right? So behavior, Problem with the behavior, problem with that problem, problem linking. Okay. So instead what we do is feature or like action item, which allows you to benefit, which ultimately means benefit of that benefit. So we, we problem link, we benefit link. Okay. Does that make sense? And they're like, yes. What are your thoughts on that? So we do a double tie down. Cause when you say, does that make sense? They're always going to say yes. What are your thoughts on that? They're like, what are my thoughts on that? Don't say any thoughts on that. They're like, nope. What are your thoughts on that? Okay. Whatever reason, I don't know why this is. When you ask what, not any, you get a response. Uh, if you say any, they say no. I don't know why that is. It's just true. Test it. Um, 
Does that make sense? What are your thoughts on that? They're like, well, yeah, I mean, I really think, they're just gonna like kinda, you know, there's no price on the table right now. So they're kinda like, oh yeah, I think it'll totally work. They're talking themselves into it. Now, a couple things here. Look at what I did, is I said, when it comes to desired outcome, reassociating the outcome, here's the problem, I'm educating, okay? Most people out there, us versus them frame, are trying to do incorrect behavior, right? And here's the, and then I, and then I problem link. So instead, us versus this, the us versus them frame, what we do is special methodology, which allows us to benefit and ultimately the benefit. Does that make sense? Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> and so they're like, oh, I think that would work great. And then like, if I don't get a lot there, I'll say, yeah. And so based on what we were talking about earlier with like your lead generation not being up to par, do you feel like this process probably would be able to help you? Okay, well, why though? So again, we want to kind of get them talking there. Uh, so again, key points, us versus them frame, new versus old frames, uh, problem linking, benefit linking, the simultaneous explanation. So this is that, that part where I was like, the simultaneous explanation of why everything they tried in the past failed, why this is gonna be different? It's this part, okay? Incorporate as much discovery as you can. So like what you wanna do in these parts of the call is you wanna, like I know I didn't have this in the formula because you can't always use it. But if there's any other, if there's any opportunities where you can say, you know how earlier on the call you told me X and it was kind of making you feel this way? Or you know how early you told me on this call X, Y, Z, and it was causing A, B, C? Well, that's the exact reason. Like, we see that all the time. You know, what we find is when people leave that unchanged, they typically experience consequence. So what we do is, see what I'm saying? So you want to incorporate what they're saying. Uh, you want to use multiple forms of proof. So there's reason why proof, which is like the methodology behind it, living proof, social proof, and analogy, metaphors, those are all good. It's kind of like this. It's like, you know, you'd also like a great way to do this is also incorporate a personal story to prove that point to be true. And then a double tie down. So we always want to create dialogue. We never want our pitches to be an anvil drop. We want our pitches to be a dialogue. Okay. An anvil drop is where it's like, you ready? And they're like, yeah. And then it's like, like you just like hammer them with the entire pitch. It's like, save your questions for the end. And then it's like, you just pitch them and you're like, at the end, they're just like, oh, like what's going on. We want it to be a conversation. It's like we're building this pitch together in a sense. Okay. So here's a uh, example. And what I'd say here is like, gotcha. So, you know, it's going to be four steps to get your coaching business from essentially, you know, off the ground where it's at right now to a point where you're doing $50,000 a month and you actually have the cash flow to reinvest back and build a team and you have a business on the job. Okay. And in doing that, the very first thing we're going to do is build out your productized offer. Okay, so when it comes to paid traffic, here's the issue. Most coaches out there are completely focused on their ads and their funnel, when in reality, it's actually their offer. So what they do is they spend a bunch of money on ads, they test targeting, they test a bunch of bidding strategies, and ultimately they're kind of just like building their house on a foundation of sand and throwing a bunch of money away. So for example, you know earlier you said competitor X, Y, and Z was crushing it on ads and you can barely break even? Well, why is that? You both do the same thing, right? It's because of the offer. So that's the exact reason we were able to generate a million plus just off 150K ad spend last month. So instead, what we do is we first take you through an offer intensive that helps you build out your offer that's positioned as unique, different, superior than the rest of your competitors in the marketplace. And when you can do that, not only are your ads gonna work, but you'll also be able to charge a premium. And when you can charge a premium, you have more cash flow that makes ads even easier and more profitability to build a team or even pocket if you want that. Does that make sense? Cool. What are your thoughts on that? So that's how you would do that. Now, I'm kind of just like making this up here. And so this one's a little bit canned, but, um, and I wrote this right before the presentation. However, you see kind of what I did here. The key thing is though, you see how I incorporated a case study and a personal story to prove the point I'm making to be true. Okay, that's very key. So what you're gonna do is continue that process for three or four pillars. Again, the first two pillars should be kind of like insights. The last two should be like explaining uh, like what's gonna get done after we accomplish the first two, which sort of future paces and build certainty. Okay, so now we're at the committing phase, which is temp check and onboarding and investment. So here's what that looks like. So we covered all the pillars and we say, gotcha, cool. So um, you understand number four, uh, I guess what questions do you have about like the entire thing specifically? Or like what questions do you have about those four things specifically? And they start asking questions. Now when they start asking questions, you don't like, you want to answer everything in two sentences or less and preferably in one word. They're like, do I get one-on-one -on -one support? Absolutely. That's all you say. Okay. Do I get Blake? Yes. 
okay? Now, what happens is if you can't answer it in one word or it's like you don't really know what the question is, you wanna say something like this. You wanna say, well, let's say they do, do you guys do group coaching? And you're like, well, are they asking that because they hate group coaching or do they like group coaching? Do you guys do group coaching? Um, well, generally there's community aspects to what we do. But um, you know, in terms of your question, just so I can understand it better, it, 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 is there a specific reason why you're asking? And so when they say that, essentially it's like, well, you know, I, I was part of this program and I was on, you know, this big group call with 150 people and blah, 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 blah. I just didn't really feel like I had support. And then now we know the objection. But if we answer the question directly, we don't know how to handle the objection. So there's an objection hidden under the question that they ask. So we want to we want to be able to ask these, uh, um, I guess they're called clarifying questions. Okay. So after we get all the questions out, we flush all that out. We say, cool. So uh, how do you feel? Like, how do you feel about the process specifically? Um, and what we want to hear is like, we want to watch their tonality. Obviously, if they say they don't feel good, that's one thing. But typically what they're going to say is like, they're going to say they feel good. It's just that you want to ask how they, you want to see how they say it. So what you want to do is like, do, like you'll ask like, so how do you feel about the process specifically? Like, do you feel like this is what you need to be able to get your real estate business to $50,000 a month? You want to hear like, dude, absolutely. A question, you want to hear like something like that. Okay. And if they say that, you're like, okay, well, you know, and, 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 and why do you think that though? Or a lot of times, this is what often will happen is we'll say, yeah, I, uh, I think so. That's not certainty. Right? So then what we want to do is, is, is gotcha. Okay. So, so just so I can understand on my end here, you know, cause what's really important to me is alignment. You know, when you come in and you work with us, we're rolling up the sleeves, we're getting in the trenches with you. And I mean, our team is all in on this thing. So it's important to us that you feel good about the process. So like, just to be hundred percent clear on like a scale of one to 10, one being like, I do I like, I hate this guy when I get off the phone. 10 being like, that's exactly what I need. Where do you feel like you fall out exactly? Now, if it's like nine, 10 plus certainty based language, yes. If it's eight or eight, eight or below, you want to say, well, gotcha. You know, and, and I appreciate you being honest with about that. Uh, I'm just curious, like, what do you think is, is keeping you specifically from being an eight, nine, or a 10? And then now we isolated an objection that we can basically do a loop and handle this before we transition to the pitch. Now, the pitch is we, do, we transition to the pitch like this. This is like a pretty ninja phrase. So this is after we've covered all the questions and they feel really good. We say, gotcha, so you feel really good. You have no questions. Um, what's next? Where do you wanna go from here? Well, how do I get started? They're always gonna say that if you do this correctly. So uh, you'll process the investment with me. And then once we take care of that, what we do is we set a baseline. So I'm gonna give you some homework right away to see what our quickest wins can be. And then I'm also gonna have you send your current sales process and your sales script and a call to review for feedback. Most people find that they end up closing at least an additional week, a deal a week or two, just right off their very first uh, call breakdown. And then from there, we're ready to rock and roll. Does that sound good? So this is kind of a, now that I'm reading this, this is from a while ago, this is kind of mediocre. Um, but what I'm doing here is I'm like telling them, they're like, so what's the next steps? So what I do is I, I kind of paint the picture of what's going to happen after they buy to build certainty before I tell them what the price is. So I future pace and then I even add in some benefits here. Okay. And then like, yeah, that sounds good. So the investment is just 10 K and you can even do like a little chunking up thing. You get, and the investment to get you to 20, 20 K a month, ultimately quarter million a year is just 6,800. And then you shut up and uh that is it guys so here's the deal comment below uh slides and we can give you the slides but that's cole gordon out thank you for staying with me and we'll see you soon